Ok, buenas tardes. Creo que están despiertos. I know it's after lunch, and, uh, but you can say that was a lot of fun and very instructive, so I hope the energy level is still a little bit up, ok? Um, we're starting today um, with a great panel, and uh, I would like to start with a few comments of my own, because um, I think there's certain things that happened around the world that came to us. Um, Latin America, as you know, is up in arms. Venezuelans, Chileans, Equatorians, Bolivians, Puerto Ricans have taken to the streets to demand dramatic change from their governments. Well, the reasons behind these changes are different. These countries and the colonies from which we come share the common denominator of economic pain, weakened government institutions, and corrupt ruling military fleets. Falling revenues and austerity measures over the last thousand years for all these countries and Puerto Rico are hitting the middle class and the poor disproportionately, and they in turn are no longer willing to take the brunt. In Puerto Rico, which is what we're going to be talking about today, the summer of 2019 raised the hopes for all Puerto Ricans. We felt empowered, proud, we were no longer agachados, we were admired worldwide for standing up for what truly was very wrong. Three months later, we're here all wondering what happened and what's next. Was this an interesting in incident that one day will be recorded in social studies books that our children read? Or did it actually mean something? Today, we have three colleagues to talk about different elements of the summer of 2019. Each of them will make a brief presentation and then we'll do Q&As and A's. I thank them for being here to share their wisdom and expertise on a Saturday. Thank you. Um, we have here Renata Vega Barracan, who will be speaking about the congressional reaction to the summer of 2019 and how this response impacted Puerto Rico. Also, Noé Samuel will speak about corruption, what needs to be fixed, can it be fixed. And finally, Rafael Torrech San Inocencio will speak about how the summer of 2019 impacted and impeded recovery funding and actions, and how can the challenges of, uh, and how can the nonprofit sector intervene and find solutions to these challenges? And with that, let's begin. Thank you, Gretchen. And thanks to the Diaspora Summit, especially Eduardo Conde and Rosa Cordero for having me here today. It's an honor to be here with all of you guys, who I know you're here because we share a deep love for Puerto Rico. For those of you who don't know me, I am Renata Vega Barragan. I am I have the deep honor to serve for the one and only Nina Velasquez. I am counsel for Fred Velasquez on issues of Puerto Rico. My portfolio is all Puerto Rico. Uh, I started working for Nidia on June 10, 2019. The first protest in Puerto Rico erupted July 11, 2019. <laughs> so needless to say, uh, the next month, my job became very, very intense. Little sleep and for the three weeks, Rep. Alaska's office became the center of command of information of what was going on in Puerto Rico, not only for staffers, but for the leadership in Congress and for the other member offices. Uh, during the protest, I quickly understood, since I just arrived from Puerto Rico, that I needed to provide clarity in Congress of what was really going on, and really listening to what the people on the street were protesting. I needed to be ahead of the news. I barely slept. I waked up before everyone <laughs> was sleeping or waking up because I needed to cancel the congresswoman on what was gonna happen next in the middle of amidst all of the uncertainty that was going on. I needed to provide some clarity, which was a very difficult task. Rep. Velasquez wanted to make sure that people's rights to protest would be protest protected. We wrote letters ensuring that there was the Department of Justice intervened because of the police brutality that was happening in Puerto Rico. Uh, Rep. Velasquez wanted to make sure that everyone was listening to what the people were saying and at the same time that the government of Puerto Rico wouldn't infringe upon their rights to protest. Um, it was difficult. People would call us asking to provide almost be a fortune teller of what was going to happen next. next. And I had to be honest to them and tell them it is a very uncertain time in Puerto Rico. But at the same time, we had the task of making sure that people here and the people by power of Puerto Rico to protect the democratic institutions of Puerto Rico. 
more than once I had to bring up the Constitution. I reminded that the Constitution of Puerto Rico was one of the more advanced in all the hemisphere. So with that in mind, um, we wanted to make sure all, of, all of the members of Congress were clear of that. Every night I would wake up, I would go to bed and wake up with it, somos más y no tenemos miedo. That stay with me. And it made, clearly enough, I, everyone who had and was listening and who had power of Puerto Rico was also listening to the somos más y no tenemos miedo. And I think Puerto Ricans were speaking loud and clear that they want to change and something indeed was going to happen. And, to be honest, I saw that the resignation of Ricky Rosselló was very, was gonna, was gonna happen. I didn't know what day, but it, it was something that had never been seen in Puerto Rico. And a show of force of one million people protesting was sending a very clear message to the powers that be. Unfortunately, the corruption scandal, which I like to separate from the people protesting, right? Because it was the government versus the people in this case. So when Assess, the Assess head and the Department of Education head got arrested in Congress, immediately there was a reaction. Uh, Republicans wanted to make sure uh, that the money that was being allocated to Puerto Rico would, would have some what they call now integrity measures. The bill that Rep. Velasquez had been working on for many paid funds for Puerto Rico that went to the Energy and Commerce Committee now had to have this integrity measures language and it had to be included, um, even Democrats agreed to it. So right now the bill has not made it out of the commission. It has not made it to the floor, and we're fighting hard to make, to get this money to Puerto Rico, because as Jay Fonseca said, the cliff is coming, and it's coming very quickly, and we're very worried, and Rep. Velasquez is putting all of her strength and effort in making sure we get this money for Puerto Rico. Uh, what's next? Also, making sure that the CPGPR money is dispersed. Uh, I don't know if many of you saw, but Red Velasquez pushed hard on Ben Carson at a hearing, telling, telling them that they used the corruption excuse not to disperse the money that were already allocated for Puerto Rico. And, but yet, they seem to forget that their own administration has corruption. Two senior officials were arrested for corruption in their duties in Puerto Rico. And yet, they seem to forget that. So I think that is my message. And what else I wanted to say is that I, we should really stay away from the discourse that Puerto Ricans are corrupt. We are not corrupt. We had some rotten apples in the government. People protested against it. But we come from the land of Sonia Estomayor, Nia Velázquez, Julia del Burgo, Rita Moreno, and many others who have paved the way for someone like me to be here. So that's what I wanted to leave you with, and with the leadership of Rep. Velasquez, we will keep fighting, we will do whatever we can to get the funds that are much needed for Puerto Rico, and the work goes on. Hello, can everybody hear me? Yeah, Excellent. Excellent. I'll speak loud, but I need the mic. My name is Noel Zamat, I'm the son of the island. Uh, right now, I'm doing my best to try to bring in ethical investment into Puerto Rico. I'll give you a little bit about my background. Uh, born and raised in the island in Cuba Bay. Uh, it's a little part of your Bay if anybody's been there. Congratulations, uh, Fairview. I have served in the United States Air Force for 25 years, retired as a director colonel, first Hispanic commander of the Air Force Test Pilot School. Uh, resume tidbit is about the job that Chuck Yeager had the year I was born. So I'll tell you all about it. Uh, went into industry, did a number of things, small business owner, entrepreneur, and uh, my claim to infamy is that I was asked to serve as the revitalization coordinator on the Oversight Board uh, for Puerto Rico, a role that I kept until March of this year when I resigned for reasons that after July of 19 became obvious. And that is that the government of Puerto Rico, people in the government of Puerto Rico, were actively sabotaging investment in the island. Uh, you don't have to believe me, you just have to read the news. Uh, I, like many of you, felt tremendous pride in being a son of Puerto Rico in July of 2019 when we were able to, by civic action, 
get rid of a corrupt government official with not a single person died. We were on every front page on the planet, and people were saying, let's go Puerto Rico on them, using us as an example. If that does not give you chills, then I can't help you. Uh, but what bothers me is what is next. Like Gretchen alluded, have we lost that steam, and what is next? Are we going to take that inspiration and lose it? Or are we going to take that inspiration and make sure that my grandchildren and your grandchildren actually have a Puerto Rico to go to in 20 years? That, ladies and gentlemen, I think is a question. And I'll try to give you uh, my view of three contextual issues that we need to keep in mind, and then uh, I'll save my time. Number one, in the United States, there's a, uh, the, the continental United States, uh, the 50 states, there is a, a cherished notion that the government is of the people, for the people, by the people. I submit to you that that quit happening in Puerto Rico about 20 years ago. In Puerto Rico, there is a people of Puerto Rico, and there is a government of Puerto Rico, and that government of Puerto Rico, for many decades now, has been in the business of extracting as much wealth and economic benefit they can for themselves at the expense of the people of Puerto Rico. That must stop. Uh, number two, economies do not grow by cuts alone. And they sure as heck are not going to grow by federal funds alone. So we need to work collaboratively, collaboratively with the private sector to get ethical private investment on the island at scale. My colleague, Mina Rivera, estimates that that number is about $6 billion in outside private capital that needs to come to the island. I'm in complete agreement with her. I will show you our numbers if you don't believe us but that will solve the debt and employment issues on the island. And the last thing is this. We can pay off the debt by this afternoon. If we wave a magic wand and we pay off the debt, and all of a sudden we're at, at zero, we will be back here in this room in five years. Worse off than we are now, because nothing will have changed. If there is no structural change in Puerto Rico, if government officials don't stop thinking themselves as part of la farandula and compare their efforts based on how many police escort they have and instead start thinking of themselves as public servants, if we do not change that, there will not be a Puerto Rico for your grandkids and mine. And I look forward to working with you to help find a solution. Uh, first of all, thank you, I, Edwin and the center. It's for me an honor to be here, especially since 40 years ago I used to be a long-haired, kind of hippie, uh, moving around the halls of DW and trying to find a future for myself. So I'm um, doubly as dos veces honrado. Thank you very much. When I was in DW, I learned that the most um, prominent crop of this territory uh, was grants. So I became a prospectero. I've been at it for 40 years. I've worked with the University of Puerto Rico, with um, the Philanthropy Fundación Comunitaria de Puerto Rico, and in uh, the year 2000, went on my own. And there's a lot of things happening in Puerto Rico in the philanthropic sector and in the nonprofit sector that I want to try to get in. Um, there's a lot of action going on, and unfortunately, a lot of those things are not making it to the news. But, um, like four days after I got my power back, I live in Mario Guaraguao right now, um, facing to the mountains of Aguas Buenas. Um, I got a phone call from FEMA, and they called me, do you want to work with us? And I went there, and I spent eight months with FEMA. Uh, four of them in the mitigation area and four of them as philanthropic liaison between FEMA and stateside and local philanthropy. I guess after four months they found out what I was doing before I joined FEMA. So they, they put me in charge of that. But after eight months I decided to go out because um, there was a lot more to be done. There's a lot of good people at FEMA. There's a lot of Puerto Ricans, so probably 70 to 80 percent now, but still I'm going to actually address two things. One has to do with FEMA and the recovery funding, and the other one 
has to do with the role of the philanthropic and the nonprofit sector. In Puerto Rico, bureaucracy is being used as a weapon. Um, I published an article in El Nuevo Día, I think Thursday, on that same topic. Um, obviously, you have to subscribe to El Nuevo Día now to see it. But actually, it summarizes a lot of the things that I'm going to be saying. Uh, Puerto Rico is being paid. Um, dearly for the corruption that actually everybody has mentioned. Um, but as uh, Jay said, Asha Tribble was not Puerto Rican. Her partners weren't either. This week, um, we got a, 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 an audit saying that the U.S. Corps of Engineers failed to oversight over $50 million in contracts in Puerto Rico, and they're going to keep coming. Um, I can give you in the questions and answer period some few examples, but the recovery is stalled because, as everybody mentioned, despite uh, Nidia Velasquez and other Congress people, um, it not, it, they were not suggestions, they were written into the bipartisan budget agreement that the, uh, the money must flow to Puerto Rico, it has flown to the Virgin Islands, flown to Texas. It's actually available um, in Tallahassee, in Florida, too. Um, bureaucracy is being used as a weapon. I mean, mayors in Puerto Rico have not been able to even get what they call the Cap A and Cap B funding, which is the one used for debris removal and emergency measures. Which is a big problem because if there's an emergency, they cannot call anybody because they own money to them. Um, the fixed cost estimates for permanent works are stalled. The mitigation money is also being stalled. And basically, there's not too much happening in terms of the access to funding, which by definition is the reimbursement. But I cannot go and build a safe house for the Punta Santiago community, which actually had one, um, the, the, the ocean came in one mile in one direction, and the dike built by the U.S. Corps of Engineers was four feet away from actually collapsing. We would have an old Mamellas there. That was a famous photo of the SOS written in the street. I cannot start building a safe house in Punta Santiago if I don't have an obligation because even if I get the money to build it, if I don't have an obligation, I'm not going to get reimbursed. In the meantime, the nonprofit organizations are doing an excellent work. Right in the middle of the emergency, Fundación Banco Popular came up with um, the Hispanic Federation, and I was proud to be a part of that. And, and they made what they call the Big Idea Challenges for recovery. Right now, there's seven projects being funded, two of them highly funded, bringing alternatives to food, to recycling, and to basically eco ecological education in Catano, in Barranquitas, and all over the island. Soon enough, Fundación Flamboyana, as you probably know, through the, uh, the Manuel Miranda Fund, started a, what do you might call, a virtual um, survival recovery of our arts institutions, which was very, very much affected during the hurricane, but they were very present in the summer of 2019, the Puerto Rico Community Foundation and the Ricky Martin Foundation joined to build houses in Loiza. They were they're not waiting for the for the obligations for the PWs for the mitigation money. I mean, they feel the needs of the people and they said, forget it. If FEMA is not coming or CDBGDR is not coming, we're going to go and build those houses because people need to um, build those houses. Um, the PRCF, I'm very glad to have done the first mitigation 404 application for 25 million, which is going to help 421 non parasa community aqueducts to have alternate power, which is very important because these are the communities that were abandoned by the government and decided to do their own wealth to provide themselves with water. And the Puerto Rico Foundation is actually going to provide them alternative power generators 
and high energy are pumped, and that's coming. It's the first nonprofit 404 mitigation project that has been requested an application, and I expect to be funded. Foundation for Puerto Rico is building the Autumn Ops Economy project that was very successful in Corozal, in Cabo Rojo now, in Aguadilla, in Camuy, in Arecibo, in Barceloneta, soon in Utuado, uh, in Arjuntas, which is actually the, the concept that we learned a long time ago from Willy Miranda Marin, which is the economy has to grow from within and outside. Not expect anybody to come with a billion dollars to build a manufacturing grant. Circular economy is very important. Hayuya is getting an EDA grant to actually fix the clothes. And everybody said, well, that's so trivial. It, it is not if people don't visit Hayuya and bring money in their pockets. No economic activity is going to happen in Hayuya. Hayuya, you know, Maricao right now has 3,000 inhabitants. Why? Everybody's leaving. There's nothing happening there. You want the same thing to happen to Hayuya? Uh, I can go on, the Puerto Rico Science Trust, Centro Solisolina Ferre has an agreement with HUD to actually create a non-stop. Um, but one of the most important is right here with you, and it's at Centro de Estudio Puerto Riqueño. In the middle of the summer, um, the, center, the center had an initiative that nobody in Puerto Rico has, which is to actually empower um, nonprofit organizations to fully participate in the 404 Hassel Mitigation Letters of Intention. That effort led to over $500 million in letters of intention from nonprofit institutions. And we owe that to Ellie. It's right there. All the letters of intention that were submitted were from nonprofits, and even the government is surprised about the full and high and good participation. Whether they're going to give us the money or not, that's something else. But actually, we are making sure that nonprofits are not left behind in the recovery. And that's usually what happens in other jurisdictions. It's either the state or the municipality that actually accesses the funds, and the nonprofits are left with some migajas, if you can tell. Uh, finally, in terms of the diaspora, you were so good helping us out of the emergency. I mean, everybody in Puerto Rico is thankful. I, I had three missions from stuff that I get, got from the state to Punta Santiago, where they were without power for over eight months, and other municipalities. But the emergency phase is over. We're now in the recovery. We need the same support. As Edwin mentioned in the center's uh, website, you can find the, the study done by the Rete Fundaciones, the Puerto Rican uh, Philanthropic Network, by Danny Petrovic, who you probably know from Aspira or from the Ford Foundation. Uh, she went to Puerto Rico to retire and look what she did. So uh, we can retire. And, showing that there has been a, a, the lack of support of states and philanthropy to the recovery of Puerto Rico when compared to other jurisdictions. I know we can actually, um, like Jay said, we can push um, our, our elected officials to act upon Puerto Rico, but we also have to push our state side philanthropy to actually help Puerto Rico. And one of the things that they know is that they cannot trust the government, so they have the nonprofits. And one of the things that even FEMA knows, and I'll finish with that, is that the recovery is going to take like 15 years. So you're going to have like four governments. And whoever wins, you're going to have a turnover. Nonprofits are going to be there. They can provide long-term solutions. They don't have turnover. And basically, they are accustomed to what they have operated. Thank you very much. Of the governor, Ricardo Rosselló, 
The three major demands that emerged from the protests of 2019 were greater participation in democratic processes, more transparency and accountability in government actions, <coughs> and amendments to the Constitution concerning the succession <coughs> of the governor. When I think of these three things, I think of three examples that pop to my mind, which I will mention right now because I don't want to bias the conversation, of things that are the contrary of that. Um, the question is, how much progress has been made to date? Are there any good news? Anybody? At the risk of being the uh, Eeyore from Coupe, uh, I will say that there, is, uh, there has been very little progress. Uh, you looked at the news, uh, there was an attempt to pass a Código Civil without any citizen participation. There was a change to the uh, to the election schedule, wasn't it? Uh, Código Electoral. Electoral. And uh, they essentially shut the doors to that. Uh, we could go on and on. I remember uh, back in, I don't know, April, there was allegations that the Secretary of uh, the Huge Department was issuing contracts in her apartment, allegedly with uh, the consultant and the uh, beneficiary there, and allegedly uh, nothing happened. I can tell you that that continues to happen in the government of Puerto Rico, and nothing is being done. So, to that final point about transparency, uh, that is actually one of the three causes of why Puerto Rico has significant challenges right now. Why we have such a difficult time going out to the rest of the world and tell, telling everybody that we're going to solve the problems. When you have the legislative branch in Puerto Rico essentially legislating in secret, let me say that again. This is part of the United States, and we are legislating in secret for not issues that relate to national security, for issues that affect every citizen in Puerto Rico and it's being legislated in secret. If that's not a call to action, I don't know what is. I think there's some consensus here. Because of, I'm going to interpret silence as consensus. Um, it's an excuse. And, and the, as you said, the bureaucracy is being weaponized with that excuse. So, um, that being said, we still have an image problem in Washington, D.C. What can the government do, the government of Puerto Rico, to improve that image? And what could Puerto Ricans in the diaspora do to help improve that image? I got three questions and one question, but let me see. What can our government do? Um, we need data, 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 we need numbers. The more numbers we have, the better we can do our jobs. <coughs> yes. Um, I've heard there are efforts doing that, but for example, right now with the Medicaid clip, the numbers are not even clear and the clip is coming. Mm -hmm. So that would be a good step forward. What can the, and, and please of the administration here, well, I think it's very easy to kick um, Puerto Rico while it's down, right? They we're facing the, big old, the biggest bankruptcy, municipal bankruptcy in history. The fiscal crisis has been going on forever. We are in an economic downturn for what, like 12 years? So we need to remind them that, well, there is corruption here. But they have our responsibility to the people of Puerto Rico because they are U.S. citizens. And I think that the Congresswoman Velasquez always reminds us that we have the same rights that the other people have here. And, well, if they want to talk about corruption, well, the president is getting impeached. And I think, <coughs> I think that is a lot, right? We, we have to stand high and not, as you said, not be arrodillados in the face of the U.S. government. So, a uh, point to, to follow up on that. Um, in discussions uh, as a private citizen with uh, any number of members of Congress, the Senate, on both sides of, of uh, the aisle, and you're going to beat me up if I say something incorrect, but I think you'll agree. I think there is a, it would surprise most people to know that those members, at least the ones that I talked to, uh, have a respect for the democratic process, and therefore there is a reluctance, widespread reluctance, to come in and 
you know, impose anything uh, unnecessarily onerous on the government of Puerto Rico. That's at least the people that I've talked to. But there's also a sense of the government of Puerto Rico. And I'm, remember, I'm making a difference between a distinction between the government of Puerto Rico and the people of Puerto Rico. The people of Puerto Rico made their case extremely well known in July of this year. I think there's a perception of uh, there will be help, but we need to see some clear, tangible evidence on the part of the government of Puerto Rico that things are changing. So, Gretchen, to your point, what could be done? Uh, here's a couple of ideas, and they're by no means complete. Number one, there's, uh, there's a lot of, CP was talking about this on, uh, on the first panel with Tom, uh, I think there's a tremendous energy and willingness to invest in Puerto Rico from the part of outside entities. They're still concerned about that because of a fear of a lack of a level playing field. Any actions that, and I'm talking about singular action, that the government of Puerto Rico can take to ensure that, that those funds, those investments come in and are treated fairly and equitably and allow them to have the economic benefit that the citizens of Puerto Rico deserve, uh, I think is, is useful. I'm going to go over my time just a second, but I want to tell a story on what we don't want to bring in. Okay. On Tuesday, I had a conversation, uh, as I want to do a lot, with a guy who wanted to invest in Puerto Rico, young kids, made a little money in Wall Street, and now he thinks that you know the world started uh, right after he was born. You all know the title. And the gentleman that put us together said, hey, Noel's uh, really wanted to bring an ethical capital to Puerto Rico, and I want you to hear what he has to say. So I told him about what I believe ethical capitalism is, which is, you know, if you're just going to extract value and build another enclave for the ultra-rich, that's not what we're looking for. I'm looking for investment that really helps the private sector, and, and frankly, generates a profit. I mean, we're in a capitalist world, like it or not, uh, but also benefits uh, the, the, the people. And the guy said something that chilled me to the bone. He goes, uh, well, you know, when we go to uh, the developing world, we, we have a cost for corruption that we just tack on to the investment. And uh, I said, whoa, whoa, stop right there. We're not the developing world. We're part of the United States, and uh, I don't want to com compare myself to a third world country. I actually want to compare myself to Singapore and, and the EU and the United States, and well, where the United States, to other states within the United States, all right? Uh, I want to compare myself to New Jersey, not El Salvador. Nothing against El Salvador, but that's that's really what we should aspire to. He goes, well, yeah, you know, but, uh, but that's okay. And it was very clear to me that this individual basically looked at Puerto Rico as a banana republic from everything he had seen in the news, and that he knows that there's a bunch of enclaves of very, very rich people, and his project was essentially you know, to address uh, the needs of those. Needless to say, we, uh, we're not probably going to have a subsequent meeting, uh, but that is not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about investment on the island. What I'm talking about is like Tom and CP were talking about, folks who were saying, you know, we have a better Puerto Rico out there if we do widespread deployment of renewables, and I want to put funds, probably some from social impact capital, towards that. Those are spread that across not just the energy sector, but life sciences, medical, infrastructure, social services, and there is a way forward. But to answer Gretchen's question, the government of Puerto Rico has to demonstrate by a transaction and tra by, by transaction uh, basis that you're going to bring in capital, accept it, set the conditions for success, hold those people accountable for the promises that they make for improving the livelihoods of, uh, of Puerto Ricans. That's great, but but don't say you know that's a great idea, but my cousin needs a job and uh, an apartment for his girlfriend in Miami. So why don't you team with him? That's not what we need. <coughs> Um, there's three things that were mentioned before that I also answer this. I think um, um, in the panel about energy, the fact that the disaster is an opportunity to rebuild the island. Um, Jane mentioned something that is very important. Um, something is um, gained, but something is lost. We have to change the attitude that it's a win-win. We got to get something up, like in the pensions, in order to be able to um, get something done. The third one I mentioned is how the diaspora can help um, mobilize stateside and even international philanthropies 
and to show them that nonprofits are a better investment way to actually fix Puerto Rico through their nonprofits. But something happened like two, uh, two weeks ago in Puerto Rico that has been mostly unnoticed, which is that the uh, municipalities from both parties united and created something called the League of Municipalities. Um, municipal affairs in Puerto Rico are sometimes kind of like lost. Um, they're supposed to be trivial. Um, actually, I think it's the first time in Puerto Rican history, and I'm a PhD in history, I can tell you, um, that um, government entities from both parties united in a common front, and basically access to the recovery for, um, money was the reason they did that. It, we got to follow through on that because it's the kind of coalitions that Puerto Rico needs, like Jay said, to go beyond the status of the petty politics. I'd like to add a couple of things to that conversation. Um, I recognize that as U.S. citizens, we deserve the same type of treatment but I still don't think that is enough because we are U.S. citizens, but we're still citizens of the colony. And so when a restaurant tells you that you have to wear a jacket and tie to get into the restaurant, you know, the first time they might say, okay, the second one upon, the third one they said, you just cannot come in. And maybe there are other people in the restaurant that didn't have the jacket and tie, but they know somebody in the restaurant. They get to the back door and they get a jacket and tie and they get in. We're not those people. We're the people that have to put on the jacket and tie to get in the restaurant. As far as I can tell, if one of the issues that they bring over and over and over is that we have corruption issues, and if we fail to take a single action to demonstrate that we're somehow pay, paying attention to those issues and to those concerns, then we're not going to be able to go into that restaurant, you know? And I think we have to really confront that. And the other thing in terms of the diaspora, because I am a member and an active member of that, I do think the diaspora has a role in calling out Puerto Rican governments, regardless of the party or affiliation, on their performance and on governance issues. Because if we have to haul the water for them here, asking for this, that, and the other, because we're the ones who vote and we're the ones who have Congress and senators, then we need to have somebody that we want to hold water for. And if you're breaking the law, right and left, why the hell should you? So, you know, every time I hear, oh, because we're U.S. citizens, I say, yeah, get in line. So is everybody else. You still have to play the game. And I know people break the law everywhere. But, you know, we unfortunately are members of Connie and therefore held to a higher standard. And that, unfortunately, is a fact. Now, uh, not to mention data, uh, which is, uh, and here's a great question, which I have not thought about. It's not really a question, but I think we should give it a shout out. Uh, she's talking, she or he, about, um, talk about the impact of Puerto Ricans in diaspora and on the island and not responding to the 2020 census. That is a really important issue that we don't hear about a lot. Um, it's just an acknowledgement. I mean, you have to say anything. I mean, we have to respond. Go ahead. More this, this data of Puerto Ricans, where, where the political power relies now in Puerto Rico, in which states, you know, Republicans are going to get nervous about. That is why it's so important for you to get involved in the census, make sure your neighbor also answers the census questions, because right there, life could be the, the future of Puerto Rico, right? Imagine what could happen if we had a Democratic Senate, a House, and a Democratic President. I truly believe the history will be, will, will be very different than it's right now because as Jay Conseca says, you have uh, uh, Mulvaney accepting that, yeah, they're all holding money and they're not going to do anything about it, but they're fine with it. So we just imagine what, what other world we could be living in if that political reality changed. Um, this is a question that I think a lot of people have to expect to question somebody asked, so I'm going to go for it. A recurring question in the Asambleas del Pueblo is how to harness the energy that moves so many Puerto Ricans to take to the streets and turn it into political and social transformation. Do you have any suggestions? Um, I think this is the million dollar questions. 
get involved in politics. You get involved in politics. If you want to change the system, you have to join the system. You have to donate. You have to organize. You have to canvass. You have to run for office. You have to support candidates, even if you don't agree 100% with them. If you want to, if you want to take what is being said in the Asamblea del Pueblo into action, you have to play within the political system. The only way to change it is within the system, and that is the reality we have right now. Thank you. So I think uh, the diaspora has a massive role to play, and technology has a massive role to play. Uh, we need to apply sunlight pressure to the uh, government of Puerto Rico. Uh, the people of Puerto Rico should be applying sunlight pressure to the government of Puerto Rico, and I think a big part of that is the diaspora. There should be a, a dream of a time when there is a dashboard that I can look up and see per dollar how each dollar per capita is used in education and security and medical care and everything of, of the sort. Because in Puerto Rico, we spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in education on consultants, but it hasn't gotten any better. Where are those dollars going? But if I ended up going seven billion dollars in debt, seven billion and we still pay the most expensive power among the 50 states and all the other territories. Why? Where did that money go? So if there is something that the public, the civil society can engage on and say, by the way, two thirds of Puerto Ricans live outside of the island, and, and hold the government accountable for poor performance, I think things will change. Um, just to support uh, Noel's argument, I get a, a, a power bill in which 30% is use of electricity and 70% is surcharge. So you know where the money's coming for the consultants. Um, when I was young, I learned that physics is the greatest philosophy. You underestimate physics. And there's one principle in physics that is a force in one direction will be stopped by a greater force in the other direction. If you don't know that, that's what happened this summer. Um, the problem is that the force that actually was beaten this summer is pushing back. It's pushing back with the new electoral code. It's pushing back with the pension cuts. It's pushing back with the new laws that were approved with the um, chambers close to the public. So a lot of people in Puerto Rico are expecting uh, un invierno combativo. It might not be an invierno combativo, but it might be una primavera combativa. I personally think that this is not done. We sat in front of Fortaleza Street and we did the countdown for Rosselló, but the problem is much bigger than Rosselló. And I think people will actually react again. And if that happens, the diaspora must be there with us. That being said, I think it's unreasonable to have to either go to court or have to go to the street uh, to do change in Puerto Rico. I mean, it's just, are we supposed to go to the street every time? I mean, it, it, this is unsustainable over the long term. Um, I think your suggestion about, if you care, get involved in politics is a very, very good one. Um, I was not, I don't like to take towards partisan politics, but I do have a, 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 a um, candid question. Is Victoria Ciudadana, a, I'm not trying to get into a, 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 a partisan conversation, but as a third party outlet, is that a viable conduit um, to bring change in the next election cycle? I'm really not trying to you know, support this or that party. I'm just saying, how do you break this juggernaut? That is to talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I 
Actually, no, no, it's something that was selected from the other one. I don't know if you noticed that the university, the president of the University of Puerto Rico, who I know and respect, decided not to fight the dam and to basically said no more cuts. And suddenly the students and the professors and the workers are suddenly all in the same boat. That's a change. We historians, I'm a rural historian, and I, I study barrios, and I don't have any documents. The only document I have is change. Why was this called like this and so on is called like that? Why is this street is so winding? Well, because there were mountains, etc., etc. I mean, the University of Puerto Rico situation must be watched closely because actually everybody is lining up in the same direction. Regard, regarding Victoria Ciudadana, I really don't know. Because the problem, uh, Gretchen, is that um, the system is not responsive to the people, and I think uh, Noel already said that. I mean, people are kind of, kind of, you know, are tired of pushing and pushing and pushing. I mean, there were like 12 people running for two Senate seats, and the, and the worst two that got one. elected were the one that had criminal records. <laughs> I mean, um, people don't see themselves bringing about change within the structure, which is a theory, but it's true. I'll add, uh, in the interest of uh, also not answering that question, but answering it a different way. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a card-carrying moderate. Uh, I belong to no political party. Full respect, but you know, for the for the type of work I need to do, I need to be uh, <coughs> nonpartisan. Uh, but I've had conversations with uh, both uh, on the ultraviolet and ultra red spectrum of the Puerto Rico uh, political scene, and uh, they actually agreed on one thing. They said. We have committed acts of political atrocities over the last 40 years in the name of status. And let me explain. Uh, los populares son malos porque fill in the blank. So, Mamani Hill PNP, who is as bad, but he's blue, not red. And, and then, then swap those colors out, and the exact same thing happens. So, we as a people somehow decided to completely ignore political atrocity just because you were wearing the right color t shirt. Right? Anybody doubt that? So, what I've told many of my colleagues is that, you know, uh, I am one crazy voice, but the first candidate who actually focuses on governance and actually capturing the lightning in a bottle that was July 2019 as part of their platform will probably have a disproportionate impact in the history of Puerto Rico. But that is probably going to mean getting rid of about 60% of the political operatives of that party because they're all tainted and actually start listening to civic society and actually solving the problems that Doña Maria and Don Juanito have instead of the problems that their donors have. Whether that will happen or not remains to be seen, but let me restate, we have committed and will continue to commit acts of political atrocity in the name of status, and that has got to change. Yes. I have a very different take on this, uh, and I will not answer the question of Victoria Sosa. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think we need to stop demonizing public servants in Puerto Rico. I need, think we need to stop demonizing people who vote in the special election of the senators that just happened in Puerto Rico. I think I've met a lot of dedicated public servants in Puerto Rico who know how to do their jobs, who are experts on what they do. And I think we need to stay away from this discourse that everyone is corrupt, that all politicians are corrupt, that nobody knows what they're doing. I, there's a lot of people who love Puerto Rico and who are fighting hard, and there's a lot of good candidates, new candidates in all of the parties that I want to change, but they need money, and they need support, and it's very difficult to come about that change when you are doing this in a bankrupted island. So I think this is where the diaspora has a very important role. You can help these people run for office. You can help bring new faces. You can help change the system. And I think the more we keep saying, like, oh, I'm not partisan. This is not cool. I, I'm not into politics. Well, then nothing's going to change. 
And I think that I think that, that is what I advise the Get involved and really put your your actual put the money where it's worth, right? Like talking to those people. They know the help. They want to change Puerto Rico, but they need help. Can I make a comment on her point? Um, my dissertation is on caciquismo. Caciquismo is governed by influence and its original uh, historical origins in Puerto Rico in the turn of the century. Why do I say that? The problem is not political parties, it's caciquismo. If Victoria Ciudadana is going to be caciquista, it's going to be wrong. And cacique, it's uh, in the Spanish um, restoration. Basically, people will actually um, vote for bosses, and the bosses will decide who gets elected, who gets a contract, who gets everything. <coughs> and, you know, in deep down inside, Puerto Ricans are caciquistas. And that's our political culture. It's not the party, it's our political culture, and we have to break with that. Basically, that's why we have government by influence, and that's why we have corruption. I'd like to go to two points that were made. Uh, one of them first is related to something Noe said. Uh, by the way, I have to ask you, do, do Americans call you Noe? Uh, yeah. If it's in English, they call me Noe. If it's in Spanish, they call me Noe. Okay. Anyway, um, so uh, you mentioned status as being, you know, the big enemy. I personally believe that, you know, it's, it's the thing that gets in the way of anything good um, and needs to be put aside for the good. Uh, but the other thing that gets in the way of the good is campaign finance. Uh, there has never been, to my knowledge, any attempt at campaign finance reform in Puerto Rico. The idea of crowdfunding to um, do small donor donations as opposed to big donors, the way it's done, it's, it's done more and more by the progressive arm of the Democratic Party in the U.S. has not been practiced in Puerto Rico. Are there any hopes for any type of um, campaign before type of measures, or is are they just too inbred and there's just no incentives for the parties to change? Uh, because this is the beginning of corruption. This campaign finance is <coughs> uh, backed by the way of contracts, which are giving to um, not the most able people and sometimes not even to people, as we now know. Um, so, any thoughts on the whole notion of campaign finance reform in Puerto Rico? I, I think the issue is not campaign finance. Actually, the law that governs campaign finance is, looks very much alike like the one here. And the Electoral Commission in Puerto Rico has very good lawyers that audit all of the campaigns. And actually, the audit process for the candidates is very difficult and painstaking. I think the issue is when you award the, the contracts, right? Because then you, like you said, well, the ones who donated the most get the contract. That, I think that's where it, the change needs to happen. That's where the reform is at. Um, but I actually think our campaign finance works. And as to grassroots donation, it's starting. I've seen candidates, they're racing through online. Of course, that, that requires money and an investment. But I'm starting to see, and I think it's going to change probably the result of the 2020 election. Let me answer the, uh, so I'm not going to go into the whole campaign finance uh, issue because, frankly, I, I would do it a disservice. Uh, but let me tell you a story. Uh, you know, after I left, and particularly after July, actually after the, uh, the Telegram chat came out, uh, my inbox was pretty full. My phone, box, my phone uh, was uh, ringing with a lot of folks saying it was essentially the Puerto Rico uh, corruption Me Too movement. You know, people were coming up and basically saying this happened to me as well. And uh, and I had not one, not two, not three, not four, but more like six or eight reports of uh, folks who were government employees, and I won't say the names because I don't have first-hand knowledge of this, so I'm gonna use the word allegedly a lot. But when it's eight people, you kinda go, huh, you know, maybe there's something here. Uh, folks allegedly saying, yes, I was at a meeting and the secretary who was appointed by the no longer governor basically got us in a room, said, everybody leave your phones outside, and this is what they said. They basically said, okay, ahora todos somos PNP. We are all uh, PNP here, and your job is to essentially uh, not just follow the party line, but you will 
donate and you will vote on these parties and, and these these are people that are getting paid less than forty thousand dollars a year in many cases and they have to cough up you know five six hundred dollar plate dinners that they would never go to uh, anybody think this is a lie or completely made up raise your hand now okay you probably heard several stories from your colleagues as well I think that's a significant issue and there's no I'd love to okay. <laughs> so, there, there is no way to to have some sort of independent entity that monitors that because th those people should be in jail. You know, if you're a political uh, appointee and you're basically saying, keep your phones outside, now you all belong to this party, I don't care. And if you do not, you know, I'm not threatening you, but you will lose your job. Uh, that, that's just uh, beyond the pale. I know there's some reporting in the press on that, but that's that's something where transparency and, and frankly the diaspora, this, this this you know visibility into government processing would at least help that. Just a uh, comment. Sila Maria Calderon, who was governor, um, she instituted a law to publicly finance the campaigns. It was very paternalistic, um, but then again, it actually took a lot of the pressure for the funding. I don't know why it was repealed. Um, on the point of Noel, that Noel brings. Um, for those of you who are here in the States, technology, cellular phones, video recordings. There's a representante who got fired because uh, a lady who was pushed to buy a $40 ticket for one of these meetings recorded it and gave it to the media. And actually the guy said, if you don't give it the money, you are fired, and she was fired. So basically, um, there has, there's a hotline for corruption, which is private now. People are starting to learn what is the whistleblowing laws in Puerto Rico, if there's any. Um, I mean, we have to create that wave against corruption. We're gonna go a little bit on the fast track here. Um, because we're running a little bit of time, so let's try to keep, um, these are the people. I love the answers, and but you know we have to feel that shut punchy. Um, there's one that I don't want. Uh, well, here's an easy one. You know that you can probably answer this one. Could a non poor can run for office in Puerto Rico? Yes. Yeah. yeah. You need to meet the residency requirement. You need to leave for a government one around for Senate. You need to live one year prior to the election in the district. Non-Spanish speaker? I mean, you will have a hard time communicating with the electorate, but you can do it. We we'll lose the debate. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, we don't have time. We don't have time. We're running out of time. I know you um, can't get out of here without one question about the junta, so I'm going to do it. Um, under Title sec two, Section 201B1F, meaning it's true, I'm not making it up, of the PROMESA Act, the FOMB has the authority to improve fiscal governance, accountability, and internal controls. Why hasn't the board exercised this authority? Is this a giveaway to the government of Puerto Rico in light of the demands the board is making on so many other fronts? I mean, one of the things that I have to be honest is during Verano of 2019 was, the Junta was very, very quiet, but also the Junta has never seemed to have been at the forefront of pushing for transparency and accountability and all these things that we want. I'll be, I'll be super short on that one. I'll tell you what I saw. Okay, this is not a policy discussion. This is not an opinion. What I saw was uh, an attempt under Title II of PROMESA when that happened uh, and the government pushed back, the only recourse left was litigation, uh, unfortunately. So I asked that question early on, you know, if the government of Puerto Rico doesn't do something that the, that the statute says that the board can compel them to do, what's what's the remedy? And everybody looks at me like, what do you mean the remedy? You just go to court. And and there was, I think there is a time when folks go, I, I gotta weigh this action versus the exorbitant cost of litigating that and the massive long timeline. So, in effect, it cripples a lot of those uh, those articles. That, that's, I'm just reporting what I saw. That is actually interesting. So, it, we're back to, you can go to the street or take them to court. And in this case, it was only take them to court. Um, the, um, here's another one that I think we should need to address. 
During the summer of 2019, many were concerned with the economic impact of the demonstration and expressed a desire for stability. Is stability good for Puerto Ricans? <laughs> Economist Caraballo Cueto just published numbers during the summer of 2019, and he proved that in fact there was, the economy didn't suffer. It actually, I think there was a small growth in numbers. So I think the protests had nothing to do. Um, he proved it wrong. This theory of like and the issue of the argument stability, but I mean, of course, stability is always great for any country. But at the same time, democracy and ensuring the people right to protest, I think, showed us that it can bring about change. Yeah, I, would, I would actually uh, agree that I don't think the protests had any measurable negative impact on the economy. Arguably, uh, it could have a positive impact because people felt more comfortable about the future. Yeah. And, What's that? The, actually, the bonds went up. Uh, you know, economies succeed on predictable, predictable instability, and that's kind of strange. But you know, you know that the market is sort of going to grow, but it's going to orbit up and down around that, and that's you know, how, how markets work, how pricing works. Uh, what if what doesn't work is unpredictable instability, which means I uh, I lower the price on something, and I have no idea what my demand is going to be because the economic uh, underpinnings are all out of whack. So. From that macro standpoint, stability is good, but I don't think uh, the protests affected the economy. <laughs> <laughs> stability is an outcome. It's not a problem. Yeah. It should not be a running platform either. Run on stability. I am the stable candidate. So. We have been talking all day about how to be stable. We have a lot to do. We get stable, and sometimes it has to be uncomfortable before we get to that stable part. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask one last question because that's all we have time, um, and I'm not going to. It's from a combination of things here. During the hurricane, people would call. Them. What is your donor wish? What do you want to accomplish? I mean, let them do the work. We have an excellent network of philanthropists in Puerto Rico. That's what we call a pass through grant, and that will. What I was doing in FEMA for four months, channeling that, that assistance from donors that did not know, and they were given options. The local philanthropy will give them, you know, we have this and this and this organization that can actually make the best out of that. The third thing is, uh, as I mentioned, <laughs> as I mentioned, um, philanthropists have a lot more to do with the recovery of Puerto Rico. A lot of them were very active in the emergency phase, but we haven't seen that um, thrust in the recovery. So move your philanthropies to remember Puerto Rico. We have two problems. We have uh, bankruptcy and we have a disaster. And in none of them, philanthropies, they say philanthropies, have actually matched the effort they did in similar um, bankruptcies and disasters in other states. Thank you very much.